there, this is Lindy, Lindy's Magpie Reads. I'm going to review a single cookbook today, Baking with Dory. It's by Dory Greenspan. So this is her most recent one. I think it came out in 2021. Let me just check that. Yeah, 2021. Uh, I borrowed this from the library and I would recommend it for purchase only if you need a sort of all-around baking cookbook. This has got, it's got everything from white bread to brioche to um, all kinds of cookies, uh, plain cakes, fancy cakes, uh, meringues, uh, every kind of pie that you could imagine, muffins, you know, all those kinds of things. You know, get, and they are um, interesting recipes. So, if that's the kind of cookbook you need and you don't want to always be going to um, look online for a recipe, then I recommend Baking with Dory. Also, if you keep chickens, <laughs> maybe you have a few backyard chickens and you have lots of eggs. She uses lots of eggs. Actually, for me, that's a problem. I'm sensitive to eggs and um, anything that's too eggy makes my throat close up. So um, that was a drawback for me. Um, but I, I really like her head notes. So it's really interesting to read. Um, this is how I normally read a cookbook. Um, I get one out from the library and I read it like a magazine. I love all the, um, uh, you know, whatever uh, the writer has to say, whatever the chef has to say about her recipes or his recipes. And um, Dory Greenspan does a great job of that. So I'll give you an example. This is for her rhubarb bottom strawberry top tart. She says, I love a dessert that looks like it follows all the rules, then turns out to be a rebel. This has all the components of a classic fruit tart, a sweet crust, a pastry cream filling, and a fruit topping. But it's also got a hidden layer of quickly poached rhubarb. It's cooked for only a minute, so it retains its striking personality. Even the fruit topping has a surprise. Fresh strawberries are brushed with a little of the poaching syrup and then, at the very last minute, get a perk-up squirt of lime juice and a shower of zest. But it's the pastry cream that's the least expected element here. It's made with pureed strawberries. Replacing part of the milk in the traditional recipe with fruit is a neat way to pack in more flavor. So, yeah, you know, it just, she just makes it all sound so delicious. And um, she gives a lot of very fulsome instructions. So if you are new to baking, you can be confident that things will be explained for you um, in Dory Greenspan's cookbooks. Um, so, for example, if she's talking about preparing apples for... Uh, apple pie or whatever. Uh, she explains, peel them, cut them in half, remove the core, then cut them in slices or chunks. And she says how thin or thick, you know, what size um, to make these. So you have, um, uh, yeah, fulsome kind of instructions. And uh, Sometimes I, I didn't agree with her. That's okay with me too. Uh, for example, for all of her yeast baking, she uses instant yeast. And um, I used instant yeast for a while. And in the end, I switched back to regular yeast, if I am going to use yeast at all. Normally, I would use sourdough now um, without any additional yeast. I can't even remember why I stopped using instant yeast. If, um, if any of you have strong feelings one way or the other, 
please leave me some comments. I'd love to talk about that. Um, the first section is all the breakfast. What does she call it? Yes. Breakfast. Okay. So this is where you have the breads, the muffins, quick breads, um, and uh, breakfast cakes, which oh, uh, if you're in Italy or Spain or uh, Portugal, cake for breakfast is pretty usual. I love it. <laughs> so I think I probably tried the most recipes from this breakfast section. In all, in this cookbook, I made, I tried 14 different recipes. That's unusual for me. It, it, it's typical for me to have a cookbook up from the library. I might try one or two recipes, but more often I'm inspired to cook something because of something I saw in a cookbook, but I don't follow the recipe. I'm actually not a very good recipe follower because I always want to, oh, maybe if I tweak this or change that, or um, I like to do my own thing. <laughs> and it's part of my um, drive for creativity, I guess. And Dory Greenspan uh, really encourages that. So with each recipe, she has a, um, a little section at the end that's called playing around. And um, sometimes she gives a whole bunch of variations. So like for her everything cake, that one, um, let me just see all of, I could take note of all of the different possibilities for that one. Apple cake, berry cake, tea cake, spice cake, herb cake, boozy cake, nut cake. Um, the version that I did was a citrus uh, variation. Uh, and so oranges are what I used. But, I mean, she does encourage you to play around, right? Uh, by this point in trying out the recipes, I had had it up to here with eggs. <laughs> and most of her cakes use three eggs. So I swapped out my mom's one cake recipe. And, um, and so the... So the ex so if it's a three egg cake for Dory Greenspan, um, what I did was compare side by side. So my mom's one egg cake recipe had everything else was almost the same, you know, the flour and the sugar, um, the butter, but twice as much milk and twice as much baking powder, which makes sense because the eggs are providing liquid and the extra eggs are also providing leavening. So, um, yes, I just swapped out the cake part and then did the other things that she said. So for the double-decker salted caramel cake, um, again, instead of her three egg cake, I used the one egg cake but I did add cinnamon because that was one of the flavorings in the double-decker caramel cake. But the main thing about this layer cake is that um, you make caramel. She has really clear instructions for making caramel and I just adore um, uh, all of the complex flavors that you get um, and a little bit of bitterness. I like to heat my sugar when I'm making the caramel till it's fairly dark. Um, so when you make your cake batter, before you put it in the oven, you put three dollops of butterscotch on top or caramel on top and then use a knife to kind of swirl it through a little bit and then bake it. And, and then when it comes out of the oven and cools, you um, slice it across horizontally, so um, you've got two parts. And then you take the rest of the caramel, well, save a little bit of the caramel for decorating the top, but all the rest of it, like there's about a cup or so, um, you mix it with icing sugar to make a frosting. 
and put some in the middle and some on the top. And so it was our friend Jordy's birthday and that was the cake that I made for that. And it was a hit. <laughs> so yummy. Um, what else did I make? I made um, cottage cheese biscuits. Now she talks about the difference between uh, baking powder biscuits and scones. And I 100% agree with her on that. There's a whole page talking about sort of a how-to of how to get that light fluffy texture. Um, but the main, the difference she says between um, a biscuit is that it tends to be saltier than a scone, and a scone is going to have probably going to have eggs in it. And I agree, there is no eggs in a biscuit. So, if somebody says, "Oh, these are the best biscuits ever," and there's eggs in, that's it. That's a scone. That's not a biscuit. <laughs> that's how I am. <laughs> So I made her cottage cheese biscuits um, and just a half recipe because there's only two of us. And these are um, a kind of baked good that's best eaten hot, fresh out of the oven. They were really yummy. They looked kind of raggedy. Um, I'll include a photo so that you can see, but they were, they were very tasty. And, um, and then I made muffins. So she has a lemony yogurt muffins and suggests putting blueberries in, and I did that. And um, I actually used gluten-free flour for these because um, I, I knew my brother and my niece were going to be having some, and neither of them uh, can have gluten, so they turned out perfectly. In the playing around with this muffin recipe, there's options for blackberry and lime, strawberry and ginger, and raspberry and lavender. And those all just sounded so appealing to me. I did make raspberry lavender muffins. Um, so good. However, I did not use her method. So what she does is, uh, she says you take your tablespoon of lavender flowers, dried lavender, and melt the butter with the lavender in it. And then the lavender flavors the butter and then you strain out the flowers before you use the butter in the recipe. And that is um, uh, messy and like way more work than I wanted to do. So instead I ground up the lavender in my spice grinder until it was nice and fine and I just included it all. Um, and I, I did put it into the butter first, but mixed it right in. I didn't strain it out. And also I thought, well, because there'll be these little flecks of grayish flower bits, um, lavender flowers, I also substituted um, maybe a quarter cup of rye flour for some of the wheat flour just to um, disguise that coloring. Yeah, they were great. I made um, carrot muffins with her recipe. She says uh, they're neither what you expect that them to be nor even what they seem. They're not carrot cake made as muffins, though they share many of the cake's ingredients. And they're not very sweet or particularly rich. Um, I actually disagree about that. I found them quite sweet. Um, and even with the other muffin recipes that I mentioned making, I did only put in half the sugar, but I just like things a lot less sweet. Um, but what really raised my eyebrows uh, in her word on carrots, she said, I always have packaged grated carrots in the house. I use them for a quick salad or slaw. And then um, she says, you know, to use these, but just chop them up into smaller, uh, the strands are quite long. And I just shake my head at the whole idea of pre-grated carrots. I think that you're gonna lose so much. Um, but anyway, <laughs> other than that, 
the um, there's kind of a surprise ingredient in the carrot muffins and add and that's um, pomegranate molasses which uh, has a nice subtle uh, I don't know soups on flavor I guess um, again I have the recipe so this carrot muffins is supposed to make 12 um, she does say she suggests using um, paper muffin cups because they're um, they'll stick quite a bit um, but she also says to use baking spray on the entire top of your uh, muffin tins because they tend to flow overflow and so I'm, I'm I was thinking all right she's warning me that there's a large quantity so when I half the recipe instead of making it into six muffins I made it into eight and they were just perfect muffin size no overflowing um, they were they were good there's not all of her recipes have pictures I'm not sure why but there's the um, uh, miso maple loaf so speaking of unusual ingredients it's got maple syrup and it's got miso so she suggests using white miso and I have brown miso sort of a medium one in my fridge and it worked really well as a matter of fact my sweetie said it reminded this cake reminded her of her mom's pound cake it was really yummy um, a really nice maple fragrance um, um, and in Dory Greenspan's notes she said if I owned a bed and breakfast I'd make this my signature treat yes. yeah. so it was excellent and one last recipe that I did from this chapter is the buttermilk molasses quick bread and so she got the idea for this from a guest house that they stayed at in Stockholm. And it does have um, rye flour in it. That's pretty typical of Scandinavian recipes. So I'm just going to back up and talk about rye flour because a surprising number of her recipes um, use rye flour. And that was lucky for me because I have quite a bit of rye flour from when I was doing tons of sourdough bread. And then I've really fallen off on the bread making lately. And so I've got all this, still got a fair bit of rye flour to use up. And, um, and I happen to be entirely out of whole wheat and spelt flour. So whenever she called for whole wheat or spelt, I put rye instead and it all worked very well. So this um, butter, buttermilk molasses quick bread has got um, anise and caraway and fennel in it um, as spices. And it, it's, um, it's a loaf that works well with savory, like cheese, or with, you know, butter and jam. Um, so a very, very versatile recipe that I'm sure I will make again. The next section is all about cakes, big and small, fancy and simple. And I already mentioned the cakes that I made in here. Uh, except, oh, there was one more that I made. Her um, cranberry spice squares. Now those, oh, so good. Um, so those also had rye flour in them and the spicing was cinnamon, ginger, allspice and cloves. They have molasses in them and her recipe is to use either fresh or frozen cranberries. Well, hence the name, cranberry spice squares. Um, and I didn't have those but I still had some frozen sour cherries from the trees in my yard um, and it's yeah February already and I you know froze them in July or August so time to use them up so I just chopped them up into pieces and had those in the cake and oh it was so good like with all this baking um, 
Lori and I could never keep up with it. So I'm always giving stuff away. And my neighbors on both sides can get cakes and cookies and all this stuff. Um, if you live nearby, <laughs> I would put you on the list. Um, so this, I think, was the... Uh, yeah, my, my, my neighbor, Leslie, she said five stars. She said these are definitely Moorish. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I just love them so much. Uh, Dory Greenspan calls for um, putting a cream cheese icing on top, and I just left them plain, and I found them really good that way. Uh, you've got jelly rolls, you've got um, cooked cheesecake, uh, uh, unbaked cheesecake, um, all kinds of different torts, lamingtons, so, you know, pretty much any kind of cake that you might want to make. She's got recipes in here, bunt cakes, yeah. The next section is cookies. And um, there are about nine different chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> So, um, I made a rye uh, chocolate chip cookie with a bunch of seeds in it. What did she call that one? Um, Copenhagen rye cookies with chocolate, spice, and seeds. And they have coffee in them. That's actually another flavoring ingredient that she uses pretty often. And um, she, she just uses regular ground coffee for the flavor most of the time. And the spicing in these Copenhagen rye cookies are cardamom, cinnamon, and coffee, right? Um, so for her chocolate chip cookies, one of the things that she recommends is instead of using chocolate chips, buy whatever kind of good quality chocolate you really like, whether it's milk chocolate, dark chocolate, whatever, and then cut it into chunks and have various sizes of pieces and include the dust, you know, from when you chop it up, like include it all. And then each bite of your cookie is going to have something a little bit different, either a big chunk of chocolate or a little bit. And um, it really does make a difference. I'm glad that I tried that. I, um, oh, and I also tried her World Peace cookies. So the World Peace cookies are in a, some previous cookbooks, I think, for sure, in her Dory's cookies. Um, but in this one, she's got World Peace 2.0, and as well as the original recipe. And um, I'm really glad that I tried those. I here's a, here's a picture of what hers look like. So there, um, you roll the cookie dough into a log, chill it, slice it, and then bake it. And it's basically a chocolate sablé. Um, but she's got a, a pinch of cayenne in it, and she's got um, a semi-sweet chocolate that you chop up into uh, chip-sized pieces. Uh, she's got cocoa nibs and freeze-dried raspberries that are sort of coarsely chopped or broken up. Um, I didn't have any raspberries, I didn't have any cocoa nibs, but I put everything else in. And, oh, they might be the best cookies ever, ever. <laughs> They're really, really good. Um, she talks about uh, how in Paris, she noticed that once cookies started to be popular in the bakeries, um, she said there, 
new wave creations that had something in common. There was a lot happening on their tops. Their surfaces were paved with nuts, candied and chopped. There were swishes or spots of praline, caramelized nut butter, sometimes bits of chocolate or dried fruit. It was as though a Rocky Road cookie had been turned inside out. And um, so she gives an example. Hers is a peanut butter chocolate chip, Paris style. So there's all these little bits on top. I had Dory's Cookies uh, cookbook out before Christmas from the library, and um, that's one that I wouldn't mind owning. Oh, I made so many cookies from that. <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> um, so, next section is... Oh, yeah. So the next section is um, cream puffs and meringues. I already said um, I'm sensitive to eggs. And, I mean, there's egg substitutes I do use, uh, depending on what the situation, um, uh, chickpea flour or um, aquafaba. Actually, there you can make a really good meringue with aquafaba. Um, let me think what the... Hmm. I'll put a link down below. Um, it's America's Test Kitchens. Uh, Vegan for Everybody, I think, is the cookbook that um, um, has really good vegan baking recipes in it that work perfectly, perfectly. And here's Frida. Hello, you. Um, and. You, she has, she makes, uh, Dory Greenspan makes meringues and then makes things out of the meringues. So if you were vegan, you could, um, you could adapt that way. But if you're a cream puff fan, she's got some pretty complicated things and some more simple. Um, back when I was a teenager, uh, that was, uh, I remember making cream puffs for the first time and it was so exciting. They turned out perfectly and all puffed and everything. Um, and then I made them quite a f I think quite a few times and then one time they didn't turn out and then I don't think I made them again after that. So, but um, her cream puffs with crackle and cream, um, it's a bit complicated because you make a cookie dough basically and then roll it really really thin and cut circles out and then over each cream puff before it's baked you lay a circle of this cookie dough that kind of melts into the top of the cream puff and makes it crackly and sweet and shiny and uh, I'm sure it's good but a lot of work. So the subtitle of this, Sweet, Salty and Simple some of these are not so simple, so just so you just so you know. Um, and then the next section is pies. I am not a pie baker. I'm I'm not a pie baker because I actually don't. Um, I don't even really care for eating pies. I like the middle part. <laughs> you know, skip the skip the crust or you know skip the meringue for sure if it's a lemon pie I just want the filling <laughs> um, but yes uh, she's got interesting variations so for example her lemon tart uh, it's called the French Riviera lemon tart and both the crust and the lemon curd filling are made with um, olive oil so that's kind of special. I did make um, uh, what her brownie recipe that uses olive oil and it's got um, ground black pepper in it and um, I didn't care for them. I think there were three eggs. It was just too eggy for me. I brought them over to my friend uh, Karen 
Karen's place and she, she said, I can't stop eating these. I just love them. So, um, yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, that was nice. She's got in this, uh, pies, tarts, cobblers, and crisps section. She's also got, um, you know, like pan dowdy. So if you're wondering about the difference between what's the difference between a crisp and a, um, a pan dowdy and a cobbler, you can find out in this, in this book. She's got, um, other interesting ingredients like pink peppercorns, I think, in the cranberry tart. Um, I already mentioned black pepper and cayenne, um, rye, flour, coffee. Um, she, um, she uses a lot of citrus too. So, um, and to get maximum flavor, uh, she always suggests, well not always, but many of the recipes, you rub the zest into the sugar and so you know, the sugar will t turn orange or yellow, whatever color your zest is, and then really perfumes that sugar, and then you uh, mix it in with the recipe. Um, she's got other tips like, you know, always making sure that you plump your dried fruit um, with some hot water before you use it. Um, and the final section is the savory section and actually oh in the tarts I did make one from the pie section I made a Bakewell tart first time ever I'd never you know uh, this is a British treat uh, if you're an aficionado I'd love to hear from you in the comments um, so I brought some to the neighbors again and um, so one neighbor is from Yorkshire and she says oh good I see there's lots of jam in here <laughs> so for this um, a 10 inch tart there's a cup of jam that's on the short crust pastry and then on top of that it's a, an almond sponge and then you sprinkle it with almonds sliced almonds but um, uh, my other neighbor, Karen, said that she made a Bakewell tart just following a recipe on the internet and it called for a really small amount of jam. She said maybe a couple tablespoons. She said you just spread it, spread it really thinly over the crust. And um, Leslie, when she saw this thick layer of jam, she said, oh good. She said, you're not stingy on the jam. That's what makes it good. <laughs> I was just following the recipe. And yes, yeah, so in the savory section, uh, there's things like um, goat cheese, black pepper, quick bread, um, vegetable ribbon tart, tomato tart, asparagus and lemon quiche, and custardy apple and kale cake. Like all of these things, we used tons of eggs, so I skipped those. And then at the very back is, um, you know, the sort of basic uh, things that you need. Basics, must knows, and Phillips. So I think there's uh, uh, nine. Nine different uh, crust recipes. And I did use her short crust recipe to make the Bakewell tart. And um, vanilla ice cream, caramel sauce, I made that. Um, lemon curd, cranberry curd, that intrigues me. I'm going to try that, but I haven't yet. Curbed ricotta, all that kind of stuff. So that, um, that's my review of Baking with Dory and there's that cover again that's um, a Lisbon chocolate cake on the cover that's got a layer that's kind of like a brownie layer and then there's a ganache on top and then you um, sprinkle powdered cocoa on top of that I'll try that one of these days <laughs> the 
for a special occasion. Well, uh, thank you so much for um, sticking with me on this long review, talking about this cookbook. Let me know what you think. Talk to you later.